Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our August meeting. It's great to see everyone here. Uh, we have this as our chapter slide. Uh, we have monthly meetings every month, uh, are highly active since 2020. Usually last 10 days of the month, we hold our meetings. And this is our CGL introduction um, for our group. So I've been the user group leader since 2020. Uh, I'm working as a Salesforce consultant at CFO Square, director of operations, kind cause, 17, 17 times uh, certified in Salesforce, three times Dreamforce speaker, seven years plus of Salesforce experience now. I'll give it over to Sunil to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Sunil. So I just joined as a co-leader, also the group, just helping Shiba out. Uh, my background is more finance. I'm more like a CPA and finance guy, but at the same time, Thanks to Shiva, got involved with more Salesforce and met a lot of people along the way, like Michael and other people also on the call over here. Uh, so basically, uh, we also are a Salesforce partner and we are, I'm also the executive director for Kind Cause. The mission of the nonprofit that we have is to help other nonprofits adopt technology so they can actually use tech, primarily Salesforce and all related to the tech combined together to become do more with less, basically. Uh, back to you, Shiva. And a fun fact, three of us will be attending Dreamforce. So please connect with us there and we can gang up and hang out together. <laughs> and uh, so if anybody is a first timer, please reach out and we can tell you from my experience how best to navigate Dreamforce. Um, Am I really trying to be there? Yes, from his gesture. Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> All right, so these are some of the house rules. Uh, we will, we do record all our sessions and it's on a YouTube channel. Uh, please post your questions in the chat because we'll be covering a lot of topics. So we'll handle all the questions at the end. And um, if you are uh, really impressed by some slide and cannot control yourself, please <laughs> feel free to post on <laughs> Twitter or LinkedIn with the hashtag SFDC. Uh, and we have a high possibility for people to win, uh, for one person to win a certification voucher. Uh, since we have a, not too many, oh, we have 23 now. So yeah, so there's a certification voucher to a winner. Uh, the only requirements um, that are there are that you need to have uh, the web assessor account, a trailblazer me ID, and you need to be present when we announce your name as a winner. Um, I'll just start this poll to understand how our audience is. So, poll, where are you? Right. I'm launching this poll, so please go ahead. Not very, four questions, very quick and easy. Let's go, let's go. All right, we have 42 so far. Uh, can we reach till 60 at least for our participation? All right. I think I'll end poll now for the in the interest of time because we have reached 60. Um, and so let me see the results sharing the results. Uh, all right, so we have 7% uh, from San Ramon, 36 from CA, 29 from USA, 7% from Asia, and 21% from other. We don't know what that other is. But uh, what's the level of understanding in data crowd? Beginner is 86%, 14% intermediate. And then do you use AI in your workflows? And uh, well, we have, it's a short answer. Um, not currently, not yet. Sometimes for writing, yes. For creating formulas, error finding, email creation. All right, that's great. Uh, 
Are you planning to certify in data cloud? 30% say in within one to three months, 70% says three to six months. So, and 10% says 12 month, months plus. So great. So that was all for the audience profile. Um, moving on. Um, um, second. Right. So this is the agenda for the meeting. Um, can we have an icebreaker? Who all are the first timers to our meeting today? Can you raise your hands? All right. Great. Any new certs? I had, and Dodi had, <laughs> a data cloud certification, after which we are eager to spread our knowledge. <laughs> so anyone else, any certs? Please feel free to participate and speak up. Oh, Anandi, hi. Anandi too. So anyway, so next, uh, let's go on, move on. Where are we? Yeah. I think Leslie Can raised I... her hand for something. Leslie, what was, do you want to speak something? I'm sorry. I should have put it in chat. I did get a certification in nonprofit cloud. Uh, oh, wow. This past month. Woohoo! So, sharing. <laughs> Congratulations. Big uh, Do they still have the old NPSP or did they change? I think still the NPSP one, right? The old one? Yes. Yes, it is. The same okay. content, old content. Yes. Well, yeah, it's good, like, because, uh, I don't know, before it gets more tougher, I guess. <laughs> right. Whenever that will be. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> exactly. Thanks. Uh, congratulations. It's a tough one. A big one, yeah. Thank you. Um... Sunil, can you put the timer, please? Yeah, sure. We'll do. And uh, so, yeah, where are we? Yeah, anybody hiring? Anybody hiring some new people, new faces in their orgs? Please let us know. Anybody looking? <laughs> Everybody's looking for a newer opportunity. <laughs> Anyhow. Let's move on from here. So now uh, we'll be tackling the real beef, beef of the meeting, which is data cloud consultant exam guide. So we have a guide, there's a link here. Please feel free to use that. And then uh, prepare for your data cloud con consultant credential. There's a link here. And uh, what is data cloud? First of all, let's be clear on that. So important words to note is that um, data cloud is actually a data platform that unifies all your company's data on Einstein One platform. There's actually a tab there, which is called Einstein Studio, where you can use um, Prompt Builder to access AI features. I got to know while uh preparing for this presentation so this was really helpful for me and then um it also gives 360 degree view of customer to drive automation personalize engagement and more and uh, the primary pur uh, purpose is unified profiles keywords um so if you have shiba in five different data sources and a lot of people are, call me very different names. So like, but if my email, so basically data cloud unifies my profile in, in a centralized way. So you can actually do automation, personalized engagement, et cetera. Also data cloud can handle tetrabytes of data, billions of record, records and AI use cases I just mentioned. So uh, Data Cloud is part of Einstein One platform. Data Cloud connects to every data source, combines your data to sales on Salesforce with any external source. For instance, a Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage or Azure Cloud Storage, those kind of external platforms. It also creates a trusted comprehensive layer for, of your customer, which means any of sensitive data will not be shared with the large language models um, like ChatGPT. So your company can be 
assured that their sensitive data will not be shared. So that's one of the features of Data Cloud. And it uses pre-built connectors or zero copy integrations. Uh, Data Cloud is native to Salesforce, which is why this has a niche over other others. It is native to Salesforce, so you can actually use your data residing in Salesforce in Data Cloud as well. And it is purpose-built on Salesforce. It transforms messy, scattered data across your enterprise into a unified resource. So it makes it easy to use your data to build data-driven automations and business processes. And just to have a first look of how it looks on the platform. So it, it is on the platform, on Salesforce platform. We first step is to give your Salesforce CRM admin the two primary permissions, which is Data Cloud Admin and Data Cloud Marketing Admin. If you give Data Cloud Admin permission, you will see Data Cloud Setup appear and also Data Cloud will be uh, visible in the app launcher. Uh, after that, we will get started from this quick find. We will go to Data Cloud Setup Home and we get started and we will see once we hit that button, all these check marks appear and the instance is created. So for the exam, this is how the exam looks. It total questions 60, time 105 minutes and 62 person passing score right now. Don't know if it will change, but um, I'll be handing today solution overview, which is 18% of the exam and setup and administration, which is 12% of the exam. This is how the data cloud looks. It works its magic. So it is um, data platform, the only data platform native to Salesforce. It connects. So if you can see, these are the data sources. You will see the icons like analytics, service, marketing, and commerce. And the third party icons like Amazon S3, Google Cloud Storage, Azure Cloud Storage and APIs and SDKs. So those are the data sources and it connects by batch and streaming ingestion of through that connect tab. So the next step is it connects through batch and streaming since it handles such a tetrabytes of data. It uses, usually there's a scheduling and you schedule through batch or streaming ingestion. And then you harmonize it, which in my view is the most challenging part. You uh, ha harmonize to the standard data model, uh, data cloud model. And then you, the whole purpose of the exercise, which is to unify. So unify as a single source of truth. And then with that unified data, we can have analytics, insights, AI predictions, and so on, and we can act on that data. So this is a brief overview of what it, it is and what it does. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's move on. So um, one of the things we all did was to, we went through the glossary of some terms. And uh, these are some of the terms that I came across while doing this, these two sections. So, um, you can, I mean, the primary ones are like data streams, which I'll be handling next. Now data stream is like a data source, which is like I told you, Salesforce CRM or third party data source brought into data cloud. And these data streams can be based on batch data or streaming data streams. And then there's something called data bundles, which you'll also see on the same screen. Um, it means a collection of data streams. A data bundle is a collection of data streams that is automatically mapped to data model object, for example, Salesforce CRM bundle. <sighs> I know it's a mouthful and I'm also getting out of breath. So, so <laughs> and the next step, data spaces, uh, it is an important concept. It's a logical division, partition, or to organize your data. And so let's move on. So 
I encouraged everyone to go through the glossary. It will help to clarify all the concepts. Um, data ethics was an important part of the exam, and this is constant API. And uh, there are a few couple of uh, important concepts in this. And if I can go to the actual page, uh, main thing is data must be related to individual DMO for it to be included in the deletion. Data stored in the unrelated DMOs won't be deleted. So I've attached the links, so feel free to read up on that. Um, also, <clears throat> I already mentioned about the trust layer, um, but what it does, we should be very clear on what it does and what it does not do. So what it does is harmonize disparate data, unifies profiles with related data. So it there is something called data enrichment and it in through related lists and through copy fields, it enriches the, the data is enriched. So, um, so unified profiles with re related data, build insights on unified profiles and segment harmonized data, activate data to drive relevant experiences. And what it is not is that it's not data du deduplication, it's not data cleansing, it's not master data management, it's not to golden record, it's not um, data governance. Oh, and I'm not, uh, doing the, you know, I'm not fighting for the election, but I'm just, <laughs> so uh, it's not backup and uh, disaster recovery, and it is not business intelligence platform. So these are the values it provides. Um, right. All right. So this is uh, the industry specific. Uh, use cases um, for financial services. I have just written down bold words because I knew that I'm going to get out of breath by now. So this is a segmentation for uh, um, financial services for major life events like childbirth, blah, blah, blah. And uh, healthcare and life sciences, unified profile, 360 degree view of the customer and then retail and consumer goods, it's personalized ads and personalized targeting for like top tier royalty, et cetera, and media and communications, optimal marketing ROI. Um, so what I'm handling is only this portion and still like it's a lot. So provision and setup of data cloud instance, permissions, configured in integrations to, to source or target systems. All right, so um, this is the user management. And as I mentioned before, uh, we start with get, giving permissions, and there are six primary permissions that are related, which is a really important topic. Um, there's data cloud admin, which uh, is, I'll just show you in the next slide. Data cloud user, which is primarily view only. Data cloud for marketing admin. Data cloud marketing aware, uh, uh, data cloud for marketing data aware specialist. Data cloud for marketing manager. Data Cloud for Marketing Specialist. I'll just show you all the permissions that um, are there for each one of those. But um, to manage Data Cloud users and their permissions, you must be a Data Cloud admin and have a Salesforce admin profile or permission set that grants access to Salesforce setup. Um, <clears throat> standard Data Cloud permission sets. Um, now, one should not create custom permission sets as per their um, best practices. So just use these standard data cloud permission sets. And the other thing is you do get this kind of insufficient permissions error slide. If you don't, if, if you expose Salesforce object to data clouds, cloud, the users must have read and view only, view all permission. So that's important. Um, <clears throat> and as promised, this next uh, slide contains all the permissions in one glance. Uh, as you can see, uh, the data cloud admin has all full permission, not, but no permission to segments or activation. And then the data cloud user has view only for most of the tabs, but not for setup, data space, segments and activation. And um, <clears throat> data cloud for marketing admin has 
full permission for most things, but view only for data shares. And um, you can see that uh, data cloud, uh, data cloud for marketing data aware specialists um, basically doesn't have permissions for setup or data space, but for all of those it has, and it only has segments and activation for <clears throat> view only for that, those two. Um, but marketing manager has full permission for segments and activation and market, the, uh, marketing specialist has, has full permission for segments. So these are really important concepts and should definitely give it a uh, study on that. Um, then uh, this is the data source connectors. So they're Salesforce connectors. Uh, they're data, uh, data bundles. These are like a collection of data streams as I already told, and this is automatically mapped to the data model object. And then there's SDK and ingestion API. So these three are belong to that category, mobile app, website, ingestion API, and the third party integration is Amazon S3, Google's cloud storage, and then there are MuleSoft connectors. And just to, um, this is one glance view of it. Uh, um, this is how it looks in the org. If you go to the data stream tab, you can see there's connector types, there's Salesforce CRM, Amazon S3, which is a third party connector. And this, um, I uh, integrated by, uh, this is Amazon S3. You, the important, it's important to note how the CSVs are created and integrated, and then how the folder access is given. This entire portion is really important for the exam, exam tip. Um, Oh, second, so let's move out of the slide deck. All right. Um, so this is how the data, and then uh, this is a data bundle exam tip. The marketing cloud starter data bundle includes email, mobile connect, mobile push, and that's an important one. And these are the other ones, sales cloud, service cloud, Salesforce loyalty, commerce, marketing cloud, with other data bundles. And this is what I was mentioning before, Amazon S3 connector. It lets you ingest and activate data from to and from S3 buckets, uh, SD connections for data ingestion. So these are the just how, the same thing that I just showed you on how to connect to S3, uh, Amazon S3. And so this is the uh, screenshot for the, when you create the new data stream, you will see connected resources. You will see marketing cloud Salesforce CRM, and then you will see the other sources and then MuleSoft connectors. And uh, this is what a very important part where you are, you are filling up this interface. A connection is you name the connection, you, you need to have a bucket as, ST, like this one I just showed you, this bucket is ST summer 24 right here. And then this is the folder commerce data, e-commerce data. And then there are these CSV files. So yeah, this folder name, the file name, all those are really important. Um, moving to the next slide. Yeah, and once you create the data stream, when you're configuring it, you will see these categories, profile, engagement, and other. It's uh, You cannot change the category after saving the data stream. So you have to be sure which category you want to put it in. So profile is just like a contact or account. Um, profile category represents individual account, or, um, and uh, this data is used for segmentation and analytics. Engagement category contains behavioral information. Each record captures distinct actions such as click or purchase, or in terms of nonprofits, it's like donations uh, taken at a specific time. And the other category contains information unrelated to profile or engagement information, such as product or store information. More about this, for instance, if you select 
the profile category. You will have to populate this primary key um, with some, this, some data, some uh, field here. And then if you select engagement, then you have to, the mandatory fields are event time field. So that's very important. So date time field and a primary key. And then if you choose other, then you have to select primary key. Um, so the other part is that, uh, as I was telling here, that when you when the date uh, fields are populated, the columns are populated here, you can change the data type at this point, but you cannot change after this. For instance, if there's a data type called email, and here you, you the, the, by default, the data type mentioned is text. So you have a chance to go to the drop down and select the email data type right here in this interface, but you wouldn't be able to do that afterwards. Um, then the, the data spaces, which is a very, very important concept, which I mentioned before, the logical partition. So it's single data cloud for multiple brands, regions, departments, et cetera. And as you see, the only two uh, permissions have access to create, edit, and delete, and add data to data space, which is data cloud admin, data cloud for marketing admin, others don't. Um, and there's an additional data cloud marketing data specialist who can add data to data space. So, you um, when you make a data space, you have distinct objects and user access control uh, to that data space. So it's interesting uh, part. And uh, so basically you have, a by default, you are given a default data space, but then you have the ability to create new data spaces. So, and this is the data kit. Uh, data kit is basically Use data kits to package data cloud objects, metadata, and relationships. You can ins then install these uh, data cloud elements in different org with just a few clicks. So I created a data uh, kit really quickly. Uh, I could use data uh, my account data kit bundle, which is a Salesforce CRM, an Amazon S3 data kit, which is a third-party bundle. And I could assemble that and create and have it as one kit. So, and this is about data cloud reports. Uh, it, it's delightful to know that data cloud is a report type. When you go to the new, you create, try to create a new report, you can see data cloud. This kind of reporting is really useful for um, debugging, for error handling, and it's really useful when we are doing implementation. This is Data Explorer. So Data Explorer is actually a tool in Data Cloud that allows users to view data from DMO, which is data model object, data lake object, uh, or in the calculated insights object. So this is the screenshot of how it looks. It's a tab on top, oops. And when you go there, you, you see the drop down: data lake object, data model object, Goes so forth. So these are the useful links which I'll share with you. Um, and uh, hope you liked my presentation. Thank you very much for paying attention and listening. Thank you. Uh, if I get time, I'll quiz you, which will verify whether you guys were paying attention. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. All right, I'll stop share and move to my next most esteemed presenter, Dodi, go ahead. Okay, so we had many requests while you were talking, Shiva, for your deck. Um, and I said, I think you'll be sharing it and I will share mine now if anyone wants to pop into it and follow along while I'm talking or if that's distracting, you can just watch on the screen. Um, I did include a lot of links in mine, so you don't have to write it all down. You will be able to access it. And um, I just wanted to read these last couple of questions that came in to make sure we are covering things. But uh, let me go ahead and get started. <clears throat> I'll just share right away. Your wish is my command. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, Dodi, you might have to share that link to be open by anybody, I guess, to grant access to your file. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're right. Okay, and for everybody, try it be, again. Yeah, for everybody, the recording will be there anyway, because I know Shiva covered a lot in a very short period of time. So, and same thing, Dodi's going to cover a lot of stuff too. So it's, it's a pretty big topic. Uh, so that's why we'll have a recording. That will be, I think, the poster on YouTube. Are you now seeing my screen that says ingestion, data modeling, identity resolution, unification? Yes. Fantastic. So here we go. So this is sort of an overview of data cloud. These are the three areas that I will be talking about, ingestion, which overlaps with um, some of what Shiva spoke about. So it'll be a good transition. Little transformation, little data mapping, little identity resolution. And just to talk about these terms a little bit, um, uh, this data mapping step is also known as harmonizing or harmonization. And that, term is used a couple different ways in the data cloud material. So I just want to take a minute to talk about that. As it pertains to data mapping, if you think about the data coming in from multiple sources and a particular value, let's, let's say email addresses, might be called one thing here, might be called something else somewhere else. But as we bring it into data cloud, we want to harmonize, we want to get that data singing together nicely. Um, so we map it to the standardized data model. And if you know music at all, um, I made this analogy, this is a, a D sharp, this is an E flat, those are really the same note. So when we're bringing data into data cloud, we're taking things that might be called different things, but really are the same thing, and saying where in the data model that maps to. As opposed to unification, which would be the next step after harmonization, which says, if we have multiple records for the same customer, can we figure out that that's the same customer and create a unified profile for that customer, which Shiba mentioned a little bit earlier, and we'll kind of repeat it again and again. And another thing to know is that as you read or watch videos or do trailhead about data cloud, a lot of emphasis is on individuals, doing unified individuals, um, but it is also possible to unify accounts. I think that may have come later. And so a lot of the material was written around unifying individuals, but just know that you can also do unification on accounts. Now, this term harmonize is also used another way sometimes. It's sometimes used to, to include these two steps and even these two steps over here. So on this next slide, we see that harmonize means mapping to the data model and unify means creating unified profiles. But over here in the um, documentation, where it talks about how data cloud is consumption based. So you pay for what you use in data cloud uh, and you get these credits and they get consumed as you do things in data cloud. And they divided the consumption into six, three categories, connect, harmonize and activate. And under harmonize, they are grouping not only the mapping, but the transforming, the unifying, even the segmentation, even the calculated insights. So as I say, they use harmonize both to mean one of these steps, data modeling, and sort of a whole bunch of steps here. This is uh, some of the documentation about all the different things that get that use these consumption credits as you use data cloud. And so they talk about how it's very important to do planning with data cloud. What are you going to do in data cloud? How much credit is that going to consume and make sure that you, you know, have adequate budget to do what you need to do and stay within your data credits or make plans to get more. So there's the link to 
that piece of documentation. This is another way, uh, I, I think you may find as you go through Trailhead um, and other learning materials out there that, the like Shiva said, there's a lot of terminology and there are a lot of pieces and every diagram sort of shows a different part of the pieces. So to bring all the pieces together into one um, diagram, this, this I created. So these are some of the steps that you may take in using Data Cloud. And these are all the tools that you might use in using Data Cloud. And just to point out here that calculations, calculated insights, which Anandi will cover later, are used in segmentation and are activated versus streaming insights, which are um, data, when you have streaming insights, you do data actions with those streaming insights. Um, again, it's a little, I got a little lost uh, as I saw these different terms. So I'm just trying to kind of give you that overview so that as you start to study, it will be less confusing. So here's another diagram of, of all of the data cloud has to offer. It doesn't include the connections which Shiva spoke about. So I've added that out here. And so the, the data admin creates those connections. Uh, someone can't access the deck. My, my deck, is anyone able to access my deck? Thumbs up, yes, thank you. Um, you they have to use the uh, second uh, share, the one that Sheba um, shared to access the deck. Oh, okay, great. Hope that helps somebody. Um, okay, so we, we get those connections set up, then we can create data streams, which are stored temporarily in data source objects. We can do some transformation here and get the data stored in these data lake objects. But note here that these are not S objects. These are not Salesforce. Even though Data Cloud, you interact with Data Cloud inside a Salesforce org, these objects, the DSOs, the DLOs, the DMOs, and all the other objects that allow you to do all these things, they're not S objects. They don't end in underscore underscore C. They end in underscore underscore DLM. So they are, I calling them DLM objects. <laughs> um, and note also that even though the data lake objects are visible in your Salesforce CRM, the data, and we understand that data cloud allows you to have so much data. That's the whole idea that it can handle so much data. The data is not really stored inside your Salesforce CRM. The data is stored in a data lake elsewhere, and we're able to visualize it inside Salesforce CRM data cloud through these data lake objects. And then the next step, which we'll talk about in a minute, is to harmonize the data lake data into these data model objects, then do that unification, then we can do um, insights, segmentation, and then finally act on all of that work that we did. Um, so right now, what we're going to focus on is connections are done, data streams come in, and the data lake objects are created. So there are four trailhead modules or projects that walk you through some of what you can do in data cloud. And I highly recommend that everyone who's interested in data cloud go through these four projects. Um, it, it, right at the top, it tells you if you don't have a data cloud trailhead playground, you can go ahead and get one right here. If you do have one, it will tell you when it expires and you can launch it from here. And then you can go ahead through the trailhead and verify your work at the end. Um, this trailhead playground that you get, uh, this data cloud trailhead playground that you get through this is somewhat limited. You don't get access to be the data cloud admin who can do those connections that Sheba covered. 
If you are a partner and you have access to the partner portal, you can sign up for a different version of uh, a data cloud trial org that will give you the ability to be the data admin and have access to data cloud setup. Hopefully I said that clearly. So uh, for those who won't get a chance to see data cloud setup, uh, Sheba showed a screen of it in her deck. I also made a list here of the items that you see in data cloud setup. Um, and Sheba already covered Amazon S3 connection. I just wanted to point out uh, exam tip that there are two ways to set up that connection to Amazon S3. One is with an access key and secret. And the other is through this identity provider based method. You don't have to know any more than that. If you don't have access to these things, you don't get to play with them. But uh, this is something to, to remember. Um, and interestingly, uh, apparently originally when Data Cloud was, was created, and by the way, it was called Customer Data Platform. You'll see that term a lot. It means the same thing as Data Cloud, as I understand it. Um, and originally the Amazon S3 connector was done at the stream level. You would have to give your credentials every time you created a new stream from Amazon, but that changed not very long ago so that it is set up in setup by the admin and then other users who don't necessarily have access to those credentials can go ahead and create those streams. So the streams can be created from Salesforce CRM, from a data bundle or a data kit, which Sheba introduced. And there are a ton of MuleSoft connectors already set up for us so that we can bring in data from all kinds of places, which we'll see in a minute. You could also bring in data just from a file. And there's also this bring your own lake um, capability in data cloud where you don't really ingest it into data cloud and get store it in a new data lake. You really just point to an existing data lake. So all kinds of ways to get data into data cloud. Now a little bit more about these data bundles because this terminology really threw me and as best I can understand it, the data bundles or starter data bundles come from Salesforce. And uh, Sheba had an even more exhaustive list of the available data bundles than I have here. So take a look at her deck for, a, for an even better list. Um, and uh, exam tip, um, I don't believe there is a bundle for net zero cloud or analytics cloud. This one makes total sense to me because analytics kind of comes after the fact. It's not sort of like bring in analytics data, but this one might trip someone up. So just to note. And then data kits also mention bundling. So that's why it took me a long time to, to kind of figure out what this stuff is all about. And some, if anyone on here knows any different from what I'm saying, please chime in. Or if you find out later, please let me know. But as I understand it, data kits can be created by us or by third party partners um, to bundle stuff up and, and make it available. Um, so data bundles come from Salesforce, data kits come from the community. And um, you create your kit and you package it up just like other kinds of packaging that we know in Salesforce managed packages, et cetera. So when you go in to create a data stream, and, and Shiva showed this, if uh, Salesforce has been a Salesforce CRM data has been connected, then you can go ahead and create a stream for that. If there's a data kit, you can create a stream for that. And here are all of those many MuleSoft. Uh, I counted 123 in one org, and I kind of pulled out some of these so you can see the many, many, many different places that you might pull data into data cloud from. Here's another view similar to one that Shiba showed where you could pull in, if the connection has been created, then you can create a stream from marketing cloud, from B2C commerce and all these different places. So this is a little bit in the weeds, but it's an important concept. When you provision data cloud, you have to tell Salesforce where you want it to live. 
which Salesforce org it should sit in. It could sit in your existing org, or you could provision a new org just for data cloud. And there, that's a whole topic of study that we won't get into. Why might you do one? Why might you do the other? Um, if data cloud is sitting in the Salesforce CRM where you want to ingest data from, you still have to create a stream, even though they're sitting in the same org. Or your data cloud could be sitting here in one org and you could pull in data from one other CRM, Salesforce CRM org. You could also have two different data cloud instances and you could bring in data from the same CRM to both instances of data cloud, or you could have one instance of data cloud and bring in data from two different, two or more different Salesforce CRM. So it has the capability of one to one, one to many, many to one, and any combination of these. Now, this next slide is going to ask you to put on your thinking cap and maybe you pull up your chat so you can say what you think. Um, oops, and I went too far. So if you are in data cloud and you want to pull in data from Salesforce CRM, what um, permissions do you think you need in Salesforce CRM to be able to bring that data into data cloud? And I gave you some choices here. Do you need to be able to create records, read, edit, delete, view all, or modify all? What do you think? Let's see, a view all and an edit. What do other people think? Read and view all, Ella, who's been studying, says. Modify all, view all, modify all. Okay, we've got lots of votes all over the place. All right, well, thank you for participating. The answer is read and view all, right? We're not gonna be messing, we're not gonna be creating new records in Salesforce CRM from data cloud. We're not gonna be changing records. So we don't need create, edit, delete, or modify all, we just need to be able to see the data. And so we need read and view all. And one more thing about data cloud and pulling in CRM data, you can only ingest an object once, but that means not that kind of object, but that object. So you could ingest accounts from one CRM org, and then you could also ingest accounts from a different CRM org, and then you're done. You can't, you can't ingest accounts from here more than once, and you can't import accounts from here more than once. And CRM data can be refreshed every hour. Now, just a little bit more about Salesforce CRM data. It could be in the same org where your data cloud is sitting. It could be in an external org to where your data cloud is sitting. And it, you can even pull in data from a sandbox. And there's all these different time frames for data. So batch would be hourly, near real time would be every 15 minutes, and real time would be every two minutes. So each different kind of connection and stream will come in at a different pace, different rate. And again, a little bit more about connectors, which Shiba covered, but exam tips. Um, a B2C commerce connector ingests the last 30 days of data. So something to memorize, B2C commerce, 30 days worth of data. And this kind of stuff is changing pretty rapidly. So you want, might want to check this but according to what I grabbed, it said that you currently cannot pull in data from a B2C commerce test sandbox or other non-live site. You, would, you can only do it from production. For marketing cloud engagement, when you turn it on, it's going to ingest 90 days of engagement data. There might be a quiz on this a little bit later in this presentation, so see if you can Remember those two little factoids. Google Cloud Storage, you can have five per org and they're synced hourly. 
And here's an important concept. When you create a data stream, you have to tell Data Cloud which of these it is. Shiva mentioned this and it's worth repeating. There are three types of streams. You tell it which one it is. And once you hit save, you cannot change it. If you picked the wrong one, you would have to delete the stream and recreate it. So the three choices are profile data, which means information about the customer, like name, phone number, email, that kind of thing. Or is this going to be engagement data? Things like clicks, purchases, support tickets opened, walking into a store that has a geofence. Um, these could all these are going to stream in as as it's happening. So you have to tell Data Cloud if that's the kind of data to expect from this stream. And then the last kind is called other, which would be things like products, stores, etc. So things that might be referenced by profile engagement data, but isn't actually about um, the customers or their engagement. It's something else. And the category cannot be changed once the stream is saved. If you need to disconnect a data source, this surprised me. It's not intuitive. It's just something you have to learn. You can, you've got to disconnect the stream and you've got to actually disconnect segments, which comes way down the line of all of this process. And then if, it, if there is a data stream, then you need to disconnect the data stream. You've got to make sure the data stream is detangled from data cloud. So you've got to go through all four of these steps. It can't be the, the, the underlying data lake object can't be mapped to a, to a data model object. The DLO can't be linked to a data space, which Shiba mentioned data spaces in her talk. Um, it can't be used in a transform, and it can't be associated with a data kit. So once you create one of these data sources and do all this stuff, backing it out is a whole, is a whole process, a multi-step process. So just to reinforce what I mentioned earlier, B2C commerce ingests 30 days worth of data, marketing cloud engagement ingests 90 days worth of data. So quiz time, pull up your chat again. What are the two things that must be removed before you can disconnect a data source? Nice. It helps when I ask you immediately after I teach it, but <laughs> this shows you're listening. Thank you <laughs> and absorbing. Great. So it's the data streams and the segmentations. But of course, if you have to detangle the data stream, then you also have to detangle these other things. So now let's talk briefly about transforms. So Sheba mentioned this, but it bears repeating. Salesforce, I mean, data cloud is not primarily about data cleansing, deduping, and transforming your data. It's not about eliminating the need to keep your data in other sources clean. Uh, it's, it's not uh, overreaching, right? What is Data Cloud there for? It does allow for some transformation of the data so that you can do the segmenting, the monitoring, and using these large data volumes to provide a more personalized customer experience. So we have three different kinds of transforms that can be done. One is a formula field, which is at the row level, and it happens at the time of ingestion. So I'm going to try to jump over here into my org to show you the formula field editor, which is really nice. It's, it's giving us a way to test our formula, which hopefully they will bring that over to formula editor in Salesforce CRM. Um, but this formula here, which is, it will walk you through if you do the hands-on trailhead, uh, says if the source country is USA or US, then this field called is this US based will be true. Otherwise it will be false. So we can actually test it now. And if we say China and hit test, we should get false. If we put in USA, we should get true. And 
but you know, it's only testing those two exact literal values. So if I put in US, then I get false. So you might wanna beef up your, your formula if you want it to be looking for even more values. So that's formulas. And notice that if you go to create a new formula field, we are doing that on the data stream tab. I can click new formula field. And what are the formula return types that are available? There's only four, text, number, date, time, and date. Could be a quiz, quiz question or an exam question. And I believe it's possible that when customer data platform slash data cloud first came out, these might have been the only four uh, data types available in data cloud. And I think more recently they added five more, which we'll see in a minute. So that's one kind of transform. It's row level, it's a formula field. You do it in the data stream as you bring the data in. The other kind is called a uh, batch or streaming transformation. It has its own tab, data transforms. And once you go there, it will give you the option. Is this gonna be a batch data transform or is this gonna be a streaming data transform? The batch ones run on a schedule and they offer a lot more functionality. They offer this whole GUI interface for setting it up versus a streaming data transform is more of a SQL query that is not GUIfied. So let's see if I've got a tab here ready to show you. Mm. Okay, so I'm on the data transforms tab. If I wanted to make a new one, because I don't have any, they don't walk you through this in the hands-on um, projects. So here we are, we could do a, a batch one or a streaming one. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on. Quiz question, what can you add to the data model to do light transformation at the time of ingestion? I don't even like the way I phrase this question now. It's not really the data model. It should say, what can you add to a data lake object to do light transformation at the time of ingestion? And that's great. Everybody's saying formula. I will change this to DLO. All right, so now we move on to the next step. We've got our connection. We've got our streams coming in temporarily to the DSO, into the DLO. Now is the time that we map it to the DMO. So Salesforce, I mean, Data Cloud, sorry, comes with a canonical, I had to look up that word, you know, like the, you know, religious books are called canons sometime. It's kind of like this data model is sort of like a religious experience almost. It's like data cloud is providing you with this base data model. It's also called the customer 360 data model, the data cloud data model. And we're gonna look at the ERD. I know a lot of people get overwhelmed when I bring up an ERD. I like to equate it to a street map. It's got a lot of information, can be super helpful, could be overwhelming until you learn to just take a minute to get yourself oriented and start to see how useful it can be. So everybody ready for the ERD? Here's the ERD. And I don't believe all the objects are shown here. It's just a partial representation of all of the data cloud um, DMO, data model objects. Notice that they're grouped in these shaded areas. So this is engagement, this is sales, this is loyalty, data cloud loyalty management. These are the contact point objects grouped here. And so on the next page, I'm going to show you a, a graphic that I made of these different subject areas. That's what Data Cloud calls them, subject areas. So here's the case, engagement, loyalty, party, privacy, product, sales. 
And there are other additional standard data model objects that don't fit into one of these subject areas. I made up this little acronym by the first letter of each of these, might help you memorize them. Case, engagement, loyalty, then three Ps, party, privacy, product, sales, and other. And just to take one of those areas, the engagement data model, these are all the DMOs that are available to map to, just in the engagement subject area. So um, I got a little confused again in studying this about whether the data model exists before you map to it or it doesn't exist until you map to it. Um, and I think what we clearly see is that data cloud comes out of the box with this standard canonical data model sort of waiting for you to map your data sources to it. And it tries to help in various ways. Sometimes the mapping will almost magically happen, but it's up to us to make sure that it's mapped correctly. So don't just rely on some automatic mapping that might happen. Another thing is that the standard data model is made up of these standard DM data model objects. Um, and the, the literature talks about a custom data model. And what they're talking about there is coming into data cloud and creating all your own data model objects and just mapping to those. And Salesforce is not recommending that. Salesforce is saying, check out the standard DMOs and try to use them if you can. But if you need something custom that doesn't come out of the box, then you can certainly create a custom data model object to accommodate that. And now you have sort of a hybrid data model, which is a combination of standard data model objects and some custom data model objects that you create yourself. And that might be, you know, after just using only standard might be the next most common kind of data model that you might have. So again, always review the mapping. There are two ways to get to the mapping I found. One way is on the data streams tab. The other is on a data lake object. And when you get there, you might say, wait a minute, how do I get to mapping from here? In both cases, there's a data mapping component on the page and a review button. So let's see if we can show that in the org. So here I'm on data stream and I've got all these tabs over here. I've got a highlight panel. I've got all this information over here, but over here I've got the data mapping component and I can review the data mapping for this data stream that I already selected. So I click review and it brings us into this totally cool, interactive, graphical data mapping tool. And now I encourage you to observe. On this side, we have the data lake objects, DLO. And on this side, we have data model objects, DMO. For some reason, they don't call it data model object over here. They call it data model entity, but it means data model object. And so this lead stream from Salesforce CRM the, the data lake object is over here on the left and it's mapping to multiple data model objects. We can see lead here, individual, contact point phone, contact point email. And the lines are telling us what's mapped to what through these little buttons. If I click on one, then the line highlights, which is helpful. And it also pops up this that tells us what field is mapped to what other field. Now, if I look at this one here, we see country is mapped to country on the contact point address object. But look here, it's also mapped somewhere else down here. And if we sort of follow it along, and I don't see how they made it that easy to find, but here we see country on the lead object. Country, country, here it is. So 
country is mapped to country on the lead object in addition to being mapped to country on the contact point address data model object. So what we see is a many to one relationship here. One field in the DLO can be mapped to multiple fields in DMOs. But how about on this side? Can multiple DLOs be mapped into one DMO field? We don't see any of that here. We see just one coming in to each one, which makes sense. If we said map this field and this field to here, then which one would it take? So this is a many to one relationship. We can also specify the relationships between objects and we should check them. Here are some examples down here. The account contact using the email field is connected via a many to one relationship with the contact point email. And this is the field on this object that it's connecting to. So this is all part of verifying, checking, fixing, the mapping between a data lake object and your data model objects. Make sure the relationships are right, make sure the fields are mapped correctly. And here you could add a field to the data model. I wanted to point out, this tripped me up in the beginning. So for each object, we see the mapped fields. And then there's a link at the bottom for the unmapped fields. There are 40 of them here. I click this and it pops open. And now we see all these fields available in the data model object that we could be mapping to, but we're not yet mapping to. And if we wanted to create a new field on this object, this is where we see it. It's hiding under unmapped. So you open up unmapped, then you can create a new field. And what kind of field can you create? not only the same four types that we saw for formula fields, but five other types, email, phone, URL, percent, and Boolean. So contact point email, contact point phone, all of these kinds of data about the customers is in a many to one relationship with either individual or account. And we see that on this ERD, which isn't as scary as the other one I showed you, but we see that the individual has a one-to-many relationship with all of these other data model objects that could contain data points about the person. And the field on each of these objects where the foreign key of the individual ID is stored is called party. And by party, they don't mean like birthday party or anniversary party. It's not a holiday. They mean party like as in, um, I always think of Lil Lily Tomlin, um, you know, is this the party to whom I'm speaking? Party meaning the individual or the account, the customer is the party. So just remember the party field is what you map all of these objects to the individual with. Uh, and just proof once again that we can map to, we can um, do all of this with either individuals or accounts. And you cannot save a mapping if an object to be mapped does not have its primary key mapped. That kind of makes sense. There is this question of fully qualified keys, which is still a bit of a puzzle to me, and we won't do a deep dive on it today, but if you are planning to learn Data Cloud and take the exam, I encourage you to take a look at all the stuff that I've got on here, see if you can figure it out any better than I did, and let me know. So quiz on data mapping. I feel like maybe I should skip these quiz questions in the interest of time because I have another whole topic to cover, which is unification, but it's short. So now on this diagram, it's shown just in this little tiny area here. And there's some best practices. Don't wait. Even though this comes so far down in the process, you really should have planned it 
way in the beginning when you did your inventory of what kind of data are you going to bring into Salesforce, which are the cleanest sources, and what are you going to do with all this data? And then when you get to unification, uh, you know, think about how clean is the data, what are the best sources. You're going to have to experiment a little bit to get the unification just right. Uh, so here's an example of a customer. She's interacting with the company in all these different ways and giving slightly different information every time she interacts. So how can we teach Data Cloud to recognize that all this data is really representing the same customer? And the way we do that is with match rules. And they give us fuzzy matching and normalized matching and some standard match rules and you can customize them, you can create your own. Uh, here's this question of golden record, and this is a debate. I still haven't understood it. I've actually opened a case with Salesforce about this because in some places they say this, this unified profile is definitely not a golden record. Golden record is a master data management term. It's a very simple thing. You take the best data for each customer and you throw everything else away. And they're saying that in data cloud, we have something better than a golden record because even though we're creating a unified profile, we are keeping all of that other data. See, we've unified her, but we're not throwing away all the order history, all the service history, all the marketing engagement history. We keep all that other data that we used to create the unified record. So this is better than a golden record. Well, is it a golden record or is it not a golden record? You, I don't know the answer. I think um, as you'll see, some places they say it is a golden record and other places they say it's not. And I think what they're trying to say is it's like a golden record, only better. So there's a lot of terminology that can get really confusing in this whole unification um, process. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to move forward and say with match rules, you have a lot of options. This is where you're going to experiment. And it's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You want to try to get it just right, because if you make it very strict, then you're sure your matches are really good, but you're not going to get as many matches. And if you make it really loose like this, which Salesforce doesn't recommend, and I'm not even sure you could set this up even if you wanted to, then you're gonna get a lot of matches, but it might overmatch and group things together that shouldn't be grouped together. So what your goal is, is to get that middle ground, some really good matching. So you get a lot of matches, but not too many or too few. And put your thinking caps on again. If you were to match on phone or email or address, isn't it possible, especially in like, even in B2C or B2B customers, the same person could give you the same phone number. The same P person, I mean, sorry, two different people could give you the same phone number. Sometimes two people share an email address. Two people could live at the same physical address. So if you only want to group the same person to the same person, then you're going to overgroup if you group on just phone or email. And how can you make sure that two people who share the same phone number won't get grouped? That would be by adding names. And that's a, an exam tip. By adding name into your matching rule, then you can not overgroup on something like phone or email. So there's two part to the matching rule, uh, to the uh, identity resolution rule set. First is the matching rules, and then is reconciliation. Because once you, once Salesforce or Data Cloud has identified a match, now it has to figure out which value to take, right? Because it's, it's it, it has noticed, let's say it has figured out, just to go back to our example here, that uh, that this is the same person, but her name is spelled a little differently in different places, or the phone number's in a different format, or the email's in a different format. So which value are we gonna take? And you can start to think about what the choices might be for this. So one choice might be 
which value shows up the most often? Or which is most recent? Maybe the most recent data is the most current data. Or it could be that we figured out that the data coming from this source tends to be the cleanest. So if there's a value here, let's take this one, followed by this one, then this one, then this one. So those are the three choices you have for reconciliation. Here we have where you set up the match rule. This is how it helps you out, setting all of that up. Here's where you can modify it. And then you can add another rule. And here's where you specify. You can do this on an object by object basis or on a field by field basis. Here you see field by field, you could tweak it and say, for this field, I wanna take the most frequent, but on this field, I wanna take this source over that source. And one more thing about unified profiles, let's say you can put some data together, but you don't have enough information to really know who this person is. It will create these unified profiles and it calls them anonymous profiles. And then if additional data comes in later that gets matched to anonymous profile, but now has the identifying information, then it turns into a known profile. And in terms of consumption, you pay for the known profiles. You don't pay for these anonymous profiles. And one more thing, another ERD, just to be aware that there, when you do unification, you go from the individual data to the unified individual data. There's this link object in between them. Same thing for the party identification to unified party identification. There's a link object between them that creates the one-to-many relationships. So I've got a few more quiz questions in here that I'll just skip through. We should all be aware that Salesforce is giving away some free data cloud to its customers that are in enterprise and above. They get a certain amount of credits that they can play around with. So you can get into data cloud if you're a customer and start doing this stuff. Um, also, I have created a series of YouTube videos about all of the terminology that you need to study data cloud. Here's a link to it. I haven't finished it yet. I'm waiting for someone to say, hey, where's the next video? <laughs> and I also have a study sheet that I'm sharing the link to. Um, for those who were in our study group, this is a new version that's a little bit trimmed down, but I've given a lot of uh, suggestions on how to study and all of the notes that I took. And this is a book that's out. I'm not endorsing it, just letting you know that it is out and available about Data Cloud. And I have more quiz questions at the end of this deck, but for now, I'm going to pass it over to Anandi. And while I stop sharing and she starts sharing, I wanted to suggest that if you want to, you stand up, you give a little stretch because this is a lot of sitting. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks very much, Dodi. Absolutely awesome. Um, so again, everyone open their camera for a short bit. Uh, we'll just take a screenshot of all of us and uh, maybe an icon like a hot hand symbol. <laughs> oh, there we go. Katie, we see you and happy to see you. All right. Um, Great. Let me take a quick screen grab. Dodi, you want to do too? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Vivek, can you do too? <laughs> All right, we don't want to have anyone not do it. Right. Good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> nice to see everybody's faces, like everyone is hidden behind the screens out there. Yeah. And well, don't even keep your camera on. Yeah, and Daddy, Dodi, the excellent session. I know there's a lot of stuff, and I guess that's why you need to have a recording and go back and listen to it again, like sections of it, not the whole thing in one stretch, uh, because you need to keep on trying to get along with that too.
Yeah, um, I, in the interest of time, I also created a, I also shared a worksheet that you might find helpful while implementation. It has everything from stakeholders to implementation. Um, text. It's in my deck, but I just wanted to quickly <laughs> bump it over to uh, Dodi so, you know, we don't fall short on time. So that's, uh, I just wanted to share so you can just look, have a look out on my, in my deck for those two. Um, uh, next, uh, do, Anandi, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> oh. I know it's a long um, oh, session. You... Can you hear, hear me okay? Yes, yes let me make you the co-host yeah. so you are able to share. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Anandi. I work as a Salesforce developer come administrator in YAI, a nonprofit organization. Um, so that's a, that's a background about my role. And today I'm going to cover about insights and segmentation and activation. Um, before I... Um, start talking about my uh, presentation. Uh, it's like I would like to share the quick document um, that really helped me to understand uh, about the data cloud. It was uh, created by partner, uh, some uh, partner org, and uh, it has a lot of videos that um, um, for people who are not able to do hands-on, they can watch the videos and understand more about the data cloud. So also uh, as a disclaimer, I, I, I could not do hands-on in this session because uh, of the, somebody was asking the if the trial org is available. For some reason, um, Salesforce does not uh, provide, um, you know, uh, a, a, a good, uh, like, um, you know, uh, all the, like, like, uh, Dev, like who people who are trying to like uh, using dev org not I, I somebody is asking to can you max your uh, screen either pre presenter mode or um just zoom in zoom in uh, um presenter mode would be good actually um, sorry um i don't know like um uh, oh okay i think let's keep going I, you go to slide show, show and then put present. Yes. Sure. Do you want me to stop sharing? No, no, no. You're, you're doing good. Just hit slide show and present. That's all. Slide show. Okay. So it looks like a whole presentation there. That's all. I can stop sharing and uh, share it again. You want me to, um, are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, we, we can see your screen and then they just have to, just hit slideshow. It's like the whole screen. They just want to see the whole screen, not the top part and everything, right? Oh, okay, sure. I'm not seeing that option to. Okay, display. that's fine. Okay, we can carry yeah, on. Yeah, it's, it's towards the right. It's towards the right where it says slideshow and right next to share. Right and next you see to share, the... okay. To the right, on top, on the top right. Uh, not this one, and then the okay. I I think so. Like, uh, just before that, no slide. Yeah, to the left. Yeah, to the slideshow right there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And present a view. Yep. Is it good? Yeah, to make the full screen. Audience tools. Yep, on the top uh, present, or what is it? Full full screen? Uh, uh, you're sharing the speaker notes, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just make it smaller. Just make this one small, that's all. It's the other one, other screen, which. Yeah, other screen we can see at the back. Just make it small, that's all. 
Okay, so this one, right? Um, yeah, yeah, just make it on the, on the top. Just just minimize this window. Minimize this window, okay. Now is it okay? No, we can still see the window. Okay, I think that we can just escape it and just, yeah, okay. Just keep it like before, that's fine. Sometimes it comes in the same screen if you don't have two monitors. Okay. All right, then. just, you need to minimize this window. We can see the two screens now. Where it says it has the X. X. The cross up a little, uh, a little bit higher. Yeah, right there. Someone just highlighted it or the, then just- In the right. Not mm -hmm. working. You yeah. mean in the the more options? Right on the top, yeah. Yeah, where, yeah. You just close this, uh, yeah. Close the window, yeah. Close that uh, speaker notes window. Okay, sure. No, all, all the way up, all the way up. Keep going up, top, top, top. In the browser. Yeah, that's it. That's not perfect, okay. Um, now you can see my screen, right? Um, yeah, we can see the full screen. Yeah. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I shared the link in the chat to about the quip document uh, that uh, has the recordings of all the uh, the hands-on session that was done by the partner org. So that is helpful for everybody to understand all the topics. And I used some of the screenshots for my presentation because um, I was not able to. Uh, do much on the trial org because of the uh, limitation. So that's why I would I I I would recommend you to uh, the documentation. So uh, first, uh, I know there is a lot to cover uh, in data cloud, and uh, Sheba and Dodi covered a lot, and basically they covered the. Uh, uh, Sheba covered the basics and. Uh, Dodi covered, I think, from um, the transformation, harmonization, and unification. And I'm today I'm going to cover about a little bit about the insights, segmentation, and activation. So basically, the data that is uh, ingested is getting transformed here, um, and then and they available as DLOs and DMOs, and these uh, D. Uh, DLOs and DSOs, and then these DLOs are getting mapped with DMOs using um, to create a unified individual with the help of uh, identity resolution. And then you use a calculated insight. So the reason you use the calculated insight is to personalize the information to target the audience. And um, the audience is created as part of the segmentation uh, process. And then it is activated and sent to the um, external source that is called activation targets. So let me um, give you an overview of uh, what, are, what calculated insights means. It's basically a multidimensional metrics that is stored in data cloud. And um, um, it, it's used to personalize the information. Um, that is sent uh, as part of uh, activation. And in the calculated insight, um, basically uh, it's like, uh, it's it's basically like querying a uh, couple of uh, objects. Here you have an example of, uh, I, I, I added a screenshot of uh, what to expect in the calculated insight. Um, this is actually an SQL query. Um, you don't need to worry about like, uh, should I need to build an SQL query for uh, building a calculated insight? But um, uh, behind the scene, scene, this is what is happening if you are using um, uh, a builder uh, for uh, for calculated insight. Um, I just quickly can show you, uh, like um, review you, what are all the elements that are present in the calculated insight? Like uh, basically you are um, selecting some attributes and aggregating them uh, between the data models, objects, and a couple of, and, and you can join a couple of data models using the join. And then, uh, and uh, 
filtering using the var class and grouping them with the by dimensions. So um, this is what is calculated insights about. And um, um, so I forgot to tell like there are two types of uh, insights that are in the data cloud. One is the first one is I covered is the calculated insights. Uh, the second one is the streaming insight. Um, basically the data that you uh, get from as part of a real time process, like uh, for example, in the website, data from the website, um, any uh, data from a real time data source that are ingested. And then uh, it is made as a part of an identity resolution mapping and then activated uh, on uh, data action. So basically, as I mentioned, um, uh, in calculated insights, you use a builder or an SQL query. The same process, you can do that in, um, in streaming insights as well. And the only difference between the calculated insight and the streaming insight is like uh, streaming insight um, takes care of the it uh, basically times the events. Um, you can see that as part of the query that is uh, given as a screenshot below, uh, where uh, the, the query is going to be more similar to what I showed you in the calculated insight. Uh, it's like getting the attributes and aggregating the measures, but the only difference is you you show the which time frame like we are going to um, uh, get the information or query the data, like the start time and the end time. And all, also we use a couple of data models, like um, objects, sorry, it's a couple of objects by joining them using join class and then uh, filtering and grouping them. Uh, and uh, maybe you can use a uh, time frame for uh, uh, grouping as well. So that's what it shows in this uh, screenshot. So this is what about streaming inside is. And as you know, there are a couple of terms that are used in the queries, uh, like attributes, measures in the previous. I went forward. So that the if you see the, if you remember the screenshot I showed you about the queries, we had a couple of uh, um, uh, like parts in the queries, like attributes, measures, and dimensions. So these are the definitions of what it is about. So attributes are basically the data points. For example, could be a customer ID or a person name and measures. I think uh, if anybody, any of you, know like about more about the tableau or any analytics tool they use the measures and dimensions for uh, building a complex analytics so uh, for measures uh, th those are like quantitative values for example like uh, making a sum of uh, the amount that is spent for a product or like uh, something like that or at creating an average uh, but dimensions are like more like a qualitative value. You categorize a measure. For example, it could be an ID or um, any kind of like uh, like category, like whether it's product or stores, something like that. Those come under dimensions. And foreign key and primary key you learn as part of the uh, data cloud learning process because those are very important to, because we are, since we are dealing with a couple of objects in our data cloud, uh, it's better to know what is a foreign key and a primary key are. I think the foreign key is basically um, connects all the related databases, and but the primary key is like a uniquely identified the table, uh, a, a, a parent table, something like that. Foreign key connects all the child data with the parent table. And here is the um, 
screenshot of like uh, how to create a calculated insight. So when you hit a, if you see the screen, like uh, if you see the tab, if you if you navigate to the calculated insights tab and hit new, you'll get this um, uh, UI. And uh, if you are very good at querying, you can use create with SQL, but uh, those who are not um, like, um, like not very comfortable with querying, they can use query builder, sorry, the builder, visual builder. So the visual builder will have like more like drag and drop elements. Like for example, here, um, this is a calculated insight uh, where you use three different objects and they are joined by uh, say for example, unified individual and unified link individual are joined, uh, ma made a left join. And uh, say, al al along with these two joins, they join another uh, table called sales order. And finally, you can do some aggregation, like uh, sum of all the, um, you know, sum of all the uh, customers, find the sum of all the customers using aggregations. Um, this is all about the uh, calculated the insights and also to mention like streaming insights like uh, uh, and a use case for uh, calculated insights I would say like calculating a lifetime value of a customer uh, uh, like lifetime value calculations of customers who are uh, part of your sales and uh, and for streaming insights you can use like uh, say for example how many time uh, pages visited by a particular customer for a particular time frame, maybe for five minutes or something like that. Um, then coming to segmentation and activation. Um, basically, um, basically we create segmentation uh, to get a useful number of population um, to understand, like uh, get the target audience. So if people know more about marketing cloud, um, they use this term segmentation a lot. Um, basically segmentation is used to create a set of list of uh, profiles um, that we are going to target on. So why we create a segment? It's like uh, to help understand the, the audience. For example, like, um, if you are going to target a particular high um, a high value uh, customers who are always like uh, purchasing uh, products that are um, that has value more than thousand dollars or something like that, you can create a customers a list of customers um, and group them as a part of segmentation. And the workflow of segmentation is like. Uh, you create a segment, then you publish the segment and finally activate the segment. And these are the steps that you need to follow when you create the segments. It's like uh, this, these steps I, I copied, uh, I uh, referenced from the Salesforce. Uh, you can go ahead and um, if you search, uh, if you Google it or uh, search for how to create segments, you can, find this online. So here, what I, the steps are like, you, you need to use a visual builder and then click select the standard segment. And when you, um, um, in, the, in, in the next picture, I think it will show you like what kind of data space you want to use. And you provide a segment name. And this third one, the third, um, requirement for creating a segment is like uh, you select the profile like uh, which individuals you are going to target on here we are going to target on the unified individual that is created um, like the previous step where, when Jody was mentioning like how you create the unified individual as part of identity resolution so you can use those uh, unified individual and uh, use it uh, for creating a segment and uh, while you create a segment, so you need to specify the publishing type, basically like uh, uh, standard publish, 
or the rapid publish. Uh, the standard publish, it's like uh, 12 to 24 hours, I believe. But a rapid publish is like um, one hour. It's kind of short, like one every, it publishes every one or four hours. One to four hours. Or you can do a scheduled one with a start time and end time uh, and that date so that um, it uh, publishes only on the specific date uh the specific it starts publishing uh on the specific date and ends on the specific date so it doesn't uh you it, it doesn't uh, run uh, like uh, it, it doesn't run like every weekly or something like that it runs for specific time frame only or date frame only So here is a uh, screenshot of like uh, uh, how uh, after you create a segment, how the UI looks like. So um, here um, in the segment um, segmentation process, I used like um, uh, 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 a, a calculation that is like promotional um, campaign audience with RFM combined score is later than or equal to 123 so these segments um uh, so these uh, this population will be um added to the segment and the segment population count will show up in the ui like uh, every time you add any new um, conditions in the ui the population will recount and it shows up in the it shows up in the ui um that's how you know, like how many um, how many um, people are there in the population. And here is the screenshot of like um, what is the details of the previous screenshot I showed. Like uh, um, basically, the segmentation is happening on individuals or like unified individuals, uh, basically uh, people or profiles. And sometimes you can um, uh, do the publish like uh, by not refreshing. That's what the uh, option chosen here. But uh, you can publish depending upon the like full publish or rapid publish or whatever you want to do. And uh, the UI uh, after you create the segment, it will show you the direct and related attributes. Um, the direct attributes it's like uh, the individuals that you are uh, that you are segmenting on, and the related attributes be like something like uh, a contact point or something like that, like address or uh, something related to some um, like uh, details about the customers or the other profiles. So, uh, after you define your segment. You publish it using your activation targets uh, on, on a scheduled base. Um, um, the standard schedule is, is going to be like 12 to 24 hours, and uh, rapid publish is going to be one of the four hours. So <clears throat> after you publish, you can go to the After you publish, you can go to the um, screen, the segment screen, and it, it will show you the publish history, like how much um, segmentation has been published, um, and the, whether the publish is going to be the full refresh, if you choose that, and if the publish is going to be success, status will be updated in the publish history. Now coming to the uh, steps that are definition and the steps that are involved in uh, activation. Uh, activation is basically the definition of activation is like basically it's the delivering payload of segment, uh, delivering the segmentation with the supporting attributes like the direct attributes or the related attributes and are related to the uh, activation target. So. These are the steps that are involved in creating activation. First, we need to create a segment. 
um, that I, I explained earlier. And then we need to create an activation target. This could be either uh, Amazon S3 marketing cloud or any data cloud or B2C cloud. Um, after you create an activation target, you need to um, you, you need to see like um, create an activation on which kind of uh, um, profiles like it's going to be an unified individual or an individual and then you select the activation membership and also you need to in the in the in the process of creating activation you can select the attributes like uh, party attributes or contact points like address phone email something like that and then you can use um, you can publish the segment to the activation target So this is the UI that tells like uh, when you start, I think when you go to the activation tab and hit new, it will show up like this and you can select either uh, data cloud loyalty or data cloud. I think basically um, in the project, uh, sorry, in the trailhead, it recommends you to uh, hit the, uh, select the data cloud. And uh, in the activation, you specify the data space uh, sometimes the data space is you, you usually select the default uh, and whatever you uh, whatever the segment uh, that you created or any kind of segment you want to use in your activation you select over here and then the activation target which is the external target um, audience like um, uh, where um, it could be Amazon S3 or any um, marketing cloud or anything like that. And the activation membership is going to be the the unified individual that is created as part of the identity resolution. After you create an activation, you can see the the unified individuals like uh, the attributes that are included in the activation. Um, for ex here in this example, the uh, attributes that are included are unified individuals and the contact points. Uh, these are the this is the um, this is the related attribute, and then um, this will here we can see the summary of like uh, what is the data space, what is the segmentation, and uh, it shows the public schedule published schedule. Uh, uh, in previous slide, we saw it's don't refresh. And uh, this is the activation target, which is good. here in this example, we use Amazon S3. And the relate. also one more thing uh, I forgot to mention, like uh, we created some calculated insights um, in the previous slide. We can use that calculated insight as part of the segmentation or as part of the activation. And the types of activation that happens are like uh, the regular activation that happens in batches. Uh, this is for like uh, um, the the regular um, uh, the scheduled one, but um, that happens in the, like uh, schedule the the scheduled one that is publishing every colors like uh, standard publishing or something like that that happens in batches. But the data actions um, is used for real-time data streaming, and um, the streaming insight comes hand in hand with uh, data actions. <clears throat> Here is the uh, comparison of like what is the difference between activation and the data action. Basically, activating. Um, Activation is the process um, that publishes a segment of activation platforms like uh, third party to like as Amazon S3 marketing cloud or any B2C cloud. But data action is like sending a uh, direct uh, real time. Um, it's, it's like sending a real time uh, payload to the third party tool and Basically, it uses the streaming insight um, to um, to uh, 
get the information uh, from the um, to get the information and uh, the payload that is used for uh, activation is like uh, the activation target and the, and uh, for the data actions uh, it is on the real time also like um, data action uses platform events uh, to send the information to the third party tool unlike um, activation now when you create these uh, segments active uh, segments uh, or whatever like uh, unified individual so there could be some um, um, as part of the process if you are planning to um, maybe you made a mistake or like uh, creating the the segment or activation sometimes we need to delete those things so so what happens when you delete activation target so if an activation target is no longer be uh, if you if you don't need the activation target you can delete it uh, through data cloud activation target and uh, it applies to all the segments using activation target so you can delete activation target using uh, uh, if you go to the ui of the activation target there is a drop down and uh, you can delete it there um but uh, when the when the activation target is ready for use in activation um you enable it through the activation target uh, option like there is an option in the activation target where you can enable or disable or uh, in the ui so if you want to temporarily uh, remove the activation, you basically uh, disabling the activation target is re recommended instead of deleting them. In case if you want to reuse the activation target, um, it is highly recommended to disable, not to uh, remove the activation target. So this was the, uh, this is, I think, uh, what happens, this uh, slide shows like what happens if you delete a segment? So, or how to delete a segment? So if, if you want to delete a segment that is no longer needed, um, you can use the delete option, but uh, uh, as I mentioned, Data Cloud recommends, like uh, Salesforce recommends to um, um, deactivate instead of uh, deleting this uh, segment. Uh, if you delete a segment, if you are planning to use the segment again, you need to stop publishing. So you like uh, after you create a segment, you you need to publish, right? So uh, if you want to really not to use a segment, you need to um, stop publishing so that you can reuse the segment. But if you delete the segment you cannot re-enable at all. So if you uh, think that if you deleted the segment and if you think that if you need the segment again, you have to recreate the segment, uh, you cannot uh, uh, get it back because you deleted the segment and you need to get it from the recycle bin. So uh, I know I have covered a lot today. Um, let's go for the knowledge check and um, you can post the answers in the chat. Um, like, let me read the question. Uh, what are the two minimum requirements needed when using the visual insights builder, create a calculated insight? Um, the four options are where class is required, at least two objects to join, at least one dimension, at least one measure. So. You need to select two options. Um, you can uh, uh, share in the chat, like what could be the two options? Is it, uh, you monitor the chat. Yeah, I think many of you are correct. The If you see the query, um, I can go back and show the query. Uh, it,
here in the anatomy of calculated insights, you can see like uh, you use the measures and also the dimensions in the calculated insights. So the next and final uh, quiz is like a knowledge check about, um, again, the calculated insight, I believe. Um, so an administrator wants to be able to create a multidimensional metric uh, to identify, which is basically a calculated insight, to identify unified individual lifetime value, which sequence of DMOs joins are necessary within the calculated insight to enable this calculation. Um, so which option um, you choose? Is it A or D? Yeah, I think many of you are right. Because um, uh, from the question you identify like, uh, we are going to calculate some lifetime value, which is going to be present in the sales order. So that is very important. So uh, I think all the options has sales order, but um, when you are talking about like uh, multi-dimensional, uh, sorry, the calculated insights and uh, uh, that talks about the individuals, you you basically go for the unified individual and uh, that is created as part of the uh, that is created as the identity resolution and also you don't need to use an individual but you instead um, that the the you use the unified link individual that is a junction object between the unified individual and an individual the option b is the right hand And thank you so much for patiently um, watching our the session. Um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation and thank you so much. Very nice. So that makes us come to the close of the presentations. Uh, has everyone who's interested to participate in Wheel of Names entered their name in the Excel sheet? Otherwise, I'll just run with the ones I have. No, not yet. All right. Please Where's look at the, Excel the Excel sheet. Look at the chat. I'll repaste it. Yeah, I posted it again. Yeah. Thank you, Dori. So... We've read a few names there. And while everybody is entering, there are a few things I want to reiterate. I don't know whether it was covered or not, but when we are doing calculated insights, um, there's something called reconciliation rules. And you do those you have three uh, selections to choose from. Um, one is last updated, then there is most frequent, and the third one is source priority. And that's an important uh, exam tip because, um, so you want to choose which one you want to select to be um, part of your unified profile. Like, do you want the last updated updated, most frequent, or there's a source priority, which means out of a lot of data sources that you have, from where the uh, data streams are coming, which ones do you think is the most authentic representation of your data? So is it marketing cloud? Is it service cloud, sales cloud, which one? So you need to do that um, while doing the reconciliation rules. You have to select one option out of those three. And then, uh, 
strange enough, the two tabs, data, data lake object and data streams are very similar. You will see if I show you the screen, I'll share the screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah. All right. So you see, this is data streams. And once the data stream comes in, data lake object auto create, it's like this. So the two tabs are very similar. So yeah, that's what, and then when you create like a new data stream, there are three, three uh, options to choose from external files, existing or new. So if you choose external files, you have this chance to, to use Amazon S3 again. So you can export, you can import um, PDFs regularly ingest through that. So it's a external uh, data stream. So that's one thing I wanted to show. And uh, yeah, while mapping and harmonizing, there's something called, uh, Salesforce helps us by giving those warning symbols. So if when, while harmonizing, you will see a warning symbol if suppose a field needs to be mapped. And, and that's something you can do um, in those warning symbols. You, you have to map for it to be harmonized. So I just wanted to highlight those three points, which I felt were important to be to, I don't know whether it was shared or not, but I thought to, to reiterate was. And fine. Shiba, can you also just share the screen again for that uh, Excel file so people can check the names? And uh, a request from everybody not to cut anybody else's name.